And my name is Marshall Lehman. I'm a Knox County Master Gardener. And today's talk is about tomatoes. And there's so much about tomatoes that if we just do a generic tomato talk, it would last all day. So it's the end of April, right? It's April 26th. How many folks have tomatoes in the ground already? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> You've got yours in a bucket. That's a container. Where are yours? In a raised bed. In a raised bed. When did you plant them? Last week. Yes. So, okay, Kirby's down the street. Yes. Um, so you purchased the plants. Yes. Okay, part of what I'm going to talk about is if you're purchasing a plant, what do you want to look for? Mm -hmm. And if you haven't already purchased your plants, don't sweat it. Um, but I have not put mine in the ground yet. I keep watching the forecast, and then the, this night below 50 degrees pops up. And it won't kill them, but they don't like it. They're a warm season plant. And the other is that I also have pepper plants and they don't like it below 55. So I tend to wait and plant both tomatoes and peppers at the same time. So today we're talking about tomatoes and it's about getting you off to a good start. I know there's a question about pruning them. That comes a little later, but we'll, we'll field that question at the end. It's not officially part of this talk. So I want to go over some of the terminology because there are so many terms associated with tomatoes. So for instance, is to are tomatoes a fruit or a vegetable? Botanically, they are a fruit. You are absolutely correct. But some high level federal court for purposes of nutrition allowed them to be categorized as a vegetable. So there's a joke about everybody knows that Tomatoes are a fruit, but don't put them in your fruit salad, right? <laughs> but at the same time, I would tell you, I had a great salad that was made of tomatoes and peaches. What a combination, but it was actually quite good. So yes, they are technically a fruit because of the wh where their seeds are. Peppers are a fruit, squash are a fruit. Yeah, a lot of the things that we call vegetables are really <clears throat> fruits. The true vegetables are the things like your brassicas, your cabbage, your broccoli, your cauliflower. But, so if you see it called a fruit, don't panic. They're botanically correct, but you'll usually find them in the vegetable section, whether you're in the nursery or in the grocery store. They're not gonna be in the fruit section, they're gonna be in the vegetable section. And then we have type of tomato. So what types do we have? What type did you plant? Okay, on type, we've got the little cherry tomatoes, right? We have little plum tomatoes, we have Roma tomatoes, we have slicing tomatoes, we have beefsteak tomatoes, which are the behemoths, right? So there are lots of types of tomatoes. Well, cherry is usually round, and the plums are not round. They look a little bit like a pear, okay? And then you've got the romas, which are, you know, oval-shaped, smaller, used a lot, like San Marzano is probably the most popular Romano, which is used for making commercial sauce. The commercial growers grow those. Warm season or cool season? They are definitely warm season. You cannot put these out in February or March, because if you do, they will get frostbite and frost will kill them. And that's usually what finishes their season in the fall, is when's the first frost comes through that knocks them out. I would admit that most of my tomatoes have been yanked well before our first frost because they've slowed down in their production and I need the space for a fall crop of broccoli, cauliflower, and the like. Then we have this term, determinate or indeterminate. Anybody know what that means? Yeah. Okay, well. Determinant means we this hard way. Ah. determinant will only get so tall, but indeterminate will just. Correct. So the determinant, you know, the package usually tells you it'll get four or five feet tall, and then it will stop. 
The other thing about determinants is they tend to produce most of their fruits in one big flush and maybe a second smaller flush. So your commercial growers tend to do the determinant so that they can go pick everything basically at one time and send it off to the processing centers. So if you're a canner, you know, you, you put up your own tomatoes, you may want to think about having a determinant variety or two for canning so that you can get that big harvest all at one time, do your canning all at one time, rather than having dribs and drabs and doing a little bit of canning every week. So, and as, as she said, indeterminate, we don't know how tall it's gonna get. It depends on how well you water it, how much you fertilize it, but as I'll, I'll quote you, it'll grow to heaven. Um, and I saw a documentary once where they were growing some indeterminates in a greenhouse and they had this turnstile that they could wrap the, the tomato plant vine around it so that it stayed within the confines of the greenhouse. But when they unwrapped that, at the end of the season, it was 36 feet long. Yeah. And part of that goes to the original origins of tomatoes. They were a vining crop. They had itty bitty little fruits and they vined along the ground. So we've, not we, but they've been bred over the years, often to change flavor, sometimes to reduce the acid. That's why I said if you're looking for a high acid tomato, you may need to go look for some of the old time varieties. Um, but coming back to here, determinant or indeterminate, and now there's one that's in between. There are not many varieties, but there are some semi-determinant. So it, It'll get a little taller than the determinants, but it won't get as big and as long as the indeterminants. So, yeah, just another term to... Uh, I have a brochure that says you pinch out the top after so many flowers and stop it from growing. What do you think? Uh, I think that might work, but I would tell you I've not had success at that. Uh -huh. The question was, you know, pinching off to get it to stop growing. By by late August, my tomatoes are usually above the top of the trellis, and when I've tried to pinch them back to that, it has not been particularly successful. Okay, some more terminology. Here's one you want to look at. Days to maturity. So if it says, for instance, the little cherry tomatoes are usually the first ones to ripen, and that's because they have a shorter days to maturity. It's also because they have smaller fruit, and it doesn't take as long to make the fruit. Is there a difference in a grape tomato and a cherry? The grape tomato is a little more oval-shaped. The cherry tomatoes are truly round. So yeah, there are some small snacking tomatoes that are grape, and then there are others that are cherry. Yeah. And if you see them side by side, you'd say, yes, I recognize the difference. One, the cherries are almost always perfectly round, and the grape ones are a little more oblong and look more like the shape of a grape. Now, you could come back and tell me there are some round grapes, yeah, so. But if you think about your typical Thompson green grape, it's a little longer than it is wide, and that's about the size of the grape tomatoes. This is important when you go look at a tomato plant in the nursery, because when they're this size, I defy you to tell me, is this a cherry, a grape, a Roma, a slicer? All the tomato plants look the same when they're small, right? So reading the tag becomes important. And days to maturity is not such a big deal here where we live in East, East Tennessee. But when I lived in Rochester, New York, where summer was a whole lot shorter, I wanted things that had a shorter days to maturity. So I'd want a 60 or 70 day as opposed to a 90 day tomato because we couldn't set tomatoes out until Memorial Day for fear of frost. So days to maturity is important. Then you'll see these terms heirloom, open pollinated, and hybrid. This can get really confusing, but heirloom are your older varieties that have been around forever. And all heirlooms are open pollinated. Open pollinated means you can save the seed and it'll be true 
to form next year. Okay? So there are some open pollinated that are not heirlooms. They haven't been around as long, but all heirlooms are open pollinated. Then you have the hybrids. If you start from seed, your first clue is the seeds are more expensive because it took two different types of tomatoes to crossbreed and make the seed for that hybrid. It also means you can't save those seeds because what are you going to get? Parent A or parent B or some grandparent? Um, so if you're doing hybrids from seed, you need to buy new seed. You, you can't save seed unless you want to do your own experiment and you're willing to gamble on what you're going to get. Then we have color, right? We've got yellow tomatoes. We've got orange tomatoes. We have purple tomatoes. We have black tomatoes. Things like black crim. Think about Cherokee purple. The, the color usually gets worked into the tomato name somewhere. Now what about the taste? Do the colors have different tastes? Well, I would say yes, they do. But I'm not sure it's because of the color. There's some other attribute in there. You know, for instance, this, this is a cherry tomato called Yellow Mini. I've never had that one. But I grow a little yellow called Sun Gold. It is the sweetest thing I've ever tasted. Mm. Now, I've had other cherry tomatoes that were tasty, but nowhere near as sweet. But it's not the color that makes it sweet. There's something else in that plant's genes that make it that sweet. If you're going to make a bacon, lettuce, and tomato, <laughs> what kind of tomato would you make? Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll take that little sidebar. Uh, we were just talking, I would use a big mama. A big mama? A big mama. I want a tomato. Yeah. It, big mama is a tomato. Oh, okay. <laughs> it is a type of tomato. It is a Roma tomato that is about fist sized. And the reason I like it is it's a very tasty tomato and it's not a very sloppy tomato. It's got firm flesh and it won't turn your bread to soggy mess. Okay? So you can slice it and put it on your sandwich without making your bread all soggy. You get all the great tomato taste. And what do you call it if I went in the store? You will not find it in the grocery store. Well, Wilma, where did you buy your plant? Oh, she bought her plants from Burpee. It is one of the things that I, bought, I start from seed because this is my primary, for me, it's my primary canning tomato. I make sauce and salsa. Yeah. It, it's a good canning tomato. Yep. So color, there's a black crim, which has been hybridized to give it a really, really dark color. What I would say is the redder and darker it is, the more lycopene it has in it, because that's what makes it red. And lycopene is good for us nutritionally. So my favorite little sun gold doesn't have a whole lot of lycopene in it. It's got to be red to have lycopene. But it's... What's the taste? Well, the taste of sun gold is sweet. It's like snacking on candy. Yeah, you just pass by. You just, yeah. yeah. Okay, and now, if, when you're buying plants in a nursery, you may not have to look very hard, but watch for grafted tomatoes. Grafted. Yes, what it means, you know, if you, the first indication will be it will be an expensive plant because it took two plants to make it. And just as in grafting fruit trees, they take a root stock to make dwarf fruit trees, what they do is they take a root stock that doesn't grow very fast, and then they put your fruit stock on top, and that's how you get a dwarf or a semi-dwarf tree. The root stock is inhibiting the growth. Well, on grafted tomatoes, what they do is they take a tomato variety that is highly resistant to all of the soil-borne diseases, and usually a very tasteless tomato, okay? Not one you'd want to eat, but it's resistant to all those soil-borne diseases. Then they take the really tasty one, like the Cherokee purple, and they graft that on top. So it took two tomato plants to make one. That's why they're more expensive. But you also are addressing half of the disease issue, 
because the rootstock will be resistant to the soil diseases and now all you really need to worry about are the airborne diseases that, f that just float around all the time. Okay. So they, they may not be labeled as grafted. If it's grafted, it will be labeled as grafted. If it's not labeled in any way, shape, or form, it's non-grafted. But as I say, the first indication will be if you have two plants, both the same size, and this is $4 and this one is $10, this one is probably a grafted one. And you can see the little graft union, and then you want to be careful that you don't plant that one too deeply because the root stock will take over and then you'll get that tasteless tomato. But just, uh, just a heads up, there are more and more vegetables being grafted. They're, they're grafting peppers, they're grafting eggplant, and they're, they're grafting tomatoes. Yes? Uh, do the hybrids have less disease? Uh, the hybrids have been bred to be more disease resistant and or to get a particular flavor or to get a particular color. So it, <coughs> color. A lot, of the, a lot of the newer color tomatoes are hybrids, like this little sun gold that I, I love. It's a hybrid. And the folks who came up with sun gold now have come up with one called sun peach that's kind of yellow with some red streaks on it. I haven't tried that one yet, but I will one of these days. There's, yeah, Mr. Stripey is a larger tomato, more of a slicing size. This sun peach is a little cherry sized tomato. But I've seen, you know, little black cherry tomatoes. And my challenge with those is I'm not sure when they're ripe. So the ones that I tasted were like, yeah, that's not so good. I probably picked it too soon. So on, on some of the different colors, you have to be careful. And in fact, at the community garden where I volunteer, we planted lemon boys one year because they're highly disease resistant. But the problem we had is we had volunteers who were waiting for them to turn red. Well, now, as you might guess, lemon boy is not a red tomato. It's a yellow tomato. So waiting for it to turn red means that a lot of those were overripe by the time we realized what was going on. So we don't do lemon boy anymore. We only do red tomatoes so we can teach volunteers when to pick red tomatoes. <laughs> okay, now, this can be a bit of an eye test. But when you buy a packet of seeds or a plant at the nursery, that tag is going to have a whole bunch of codes on it. Here's what you need to know. The more codes, the better. Because these codes say, this plant is resistant to, and since they can't spell out all these big long names of diseases, they use these codes. So if you pick up a plant and it's only got two codes on it, and there's another plant over here with six codes on it, I'd probably go with the one with six codes. Yeah. But we've got, you know, early blight, bacterial wilt, fusarium wilt, crown and root rot, leaf spot, late blight, leaf mold, um, nematode resistant, bacterial spec, root knot. I mean, just a whole bunch. And when you get down here to verticillium wilt, which almost every tomato plant will get by the end of the season, there are different strains of it. So you may see not just a V, but V1, V2, V3. So, yeah, you don't have to remember all these. I do have them listed in the handout. But just know that the more codes on the tag, the more disease resistant that plant is. What's the one with the black spot on the tomato? Well, there are lots of diseases that start as a black spot. The question is, does it start at the bottom and work its way up? Does it start at the top of the plant and work its way down? And frankly, I don't have them all memorized, but here's the good thing. A quick search on tomato disease, UT publications, with Granger County being just up the road, we have, UT Extension has probably more tomato publications than any other state, with lots of pictures and lots of descriptions, and that's my go-to when somebody says, take a look at my plant, what do you think's wrong with it? It's like, I don't have all of these memorized because as I say, some of them will start at the bottom on older vegetation. Others will attack the tender ve vegetation first and that used to be usually as higher up. So there's a whole bunch of things that you, that you look at in diagnosing plant disease. 
But if you're buying a plant, just go for the one that has more codes. If you're buying seeds, the seed catalogs will list all these codes, but then they'll also write out, they sometimes get very explicit and say it's highly resistant to this, or it has intermediate resistance to this. So the, the seed catalogs will actually give you a little bit more description. The plant tags have limited space. So just count the number of codes. Okay, success factors. Tomatoes are a warm season crop. They like sun, they like full sun. But that's not just the only thing. It's been tempting these last couple days when it's been high 70s and hitting 80 to say, ooh, let's go, let's go set these out. Nope, they like warm nights. And their tolerance level is about 50 degrees. More importantly, they like warm soil. And the general rule of thumb on soil temperature is if you take the daytime high, so say it hit 80, and then overnight it hit 50, take that average, the soil temperature is probably about 65 degrees. So that would work, 80 and 50. You'd have a 65 degree soil. But if it was 70 and 45, you're pressing your luck. The soil is probably still a little cool. Okay, the other thing you wanna do is not plant tomatoes in the same spot every year. If you're limited in space, if you're limited in space, then you wanna do really serious amending of the soil every year. Mixing in new stuff so that you're effectively diluting any disease that may be in the old stuff. Um, but for most gardeners, we suggest a three-year rotation. So year one, I plant my tomatoes here. Year two, I plant my tomatoes in a bed over here. Year three, I plant them over here. And in year four, I can go back to that first bed. Um, and even, even at the community garden where I volunteer and we do between 160 and 170 tomato plants, that big block of five or six rows gets moved every year. We, we do not get back until the fourth year. What yes? Do the, what do the commercial growers do up in Grainer County? Well, they do a couple things. Their first crop is usually under a hoop house. So that's basically new soil every year. Then when the second crop is out in the field, they move from this field to this field to that field from year to year. Yeah, yeah, they do rotate. And in fact, Neil Denton, who's the lead county agent in Knox County, said that when he was a kid, they had a seven-year cycle. Now, that meant they also had some acreage, <laughs> right? Okay, consistent watering, right? Tomatoes are nice and juicy. They take up a lot of water. So they want consistent watering. Don't let them get all dried out and wilty and then you go out and you flood them. They really like that inch a week. And when we get to the middle of summer and it's really hot and it hasn't rained, we may actually need two inches of water a week. But what they like is the consistency. Now mother nature doesn't always cooperate, right? So we hadn't had rain I haven't put mine in the ground yet, but I'm prepping the soil. So I actually ran my drip irrigation on Sunday for a half an hour, which gives me the equivalent of about a half an inch of rain, because I knew there was some rain in the forecast, but not exactly sure how much. Um, so yeah, Mother Nature doesn't always uh, cooperate, but if Mother Nature has not been raining, <laughs> then you need to be consistently watering. And if you're growing in containers, you probably need to water every day because containers dry out faster than anything else. So you're saying an inch a, a, an inch a week. Yeah. Yeah, so you need a little rain gauge so that you can track how much it's rained and when it rained. I actually log it on a calendar so that I can quickly look and say, oh, it's been four or five days since we've had any rain. Let me go run the drip for half an hour. Give it half an inch. A tuna can works just fine, because that's right about an inch, an inch high, yes. Okay, and then a strong support, especially if you're doing indeterminate tomatoes. Uh, I like to joke, tomato cages 
are available everywhere, but they're not good for tomatoes. They're not. Unless you've got the itty bitty little patio or container tomatoes. An indeterminate tomato that's going to get six, seven feet tall. Have you ever seen a tomato cage that big? No, no most of them. Are, yeah. And, and even if you got one that tall, you'd still have to put a stake in to keep the whole cage from falling over. So uh, do I have tomato cages? Yes, but I use them for my eggplant. I don't use them for tomatoes. So what I use is, um, I've done this two ways. I have concrete reinforcing wire which you can buy a flat sheet of it at Home Depot. It's five feet and I think they sell it in eight foot sheets. But it's used when folks pour big concrete slabs. But it's, it, what I like about it is the openings are six inches square. So I can get my hand through there, grab a big tomato and get my hand back out. Right, a lot of the tomato cages um, have smaller openings. You might get your hand in, but once you put your hand on a big beef steak, you can't get it back out. So initially, I would use big, strong steel stakes, and I would put up a flat panel. So an eight-foot-long panel would allow me to put four tomato plants up against it and then start to tie them up as they get taller. What I actually do now is take that same roughly eight-foot piece and make a, a circle out of it. I still have two stakes to hold that big circle, but then I plant four tomatoes around the outside of that circle. The outside, yeah. There are folks who will make the cages a little smaller and put one plant inside, but I have enough tomatoes that I don't want to make that many cages. And then at, at the community garden, we use what's called cattle panel, which is similar, except it's galvanized metal, so it's bright silver colored, and it's a much heavier gauge. It's, it's much stiffer. But again, it, it's a flat sheet that's I think that's four feet, not five feet, by eight feet long, and there's a stake at each end holding it. No, but we don't set it on the ground. We bring it up, the bottom of it is up about eight, 15 or 18 inches, so that gets us up to five and a half to six feet, which is tall enough. With the two stakes holding it? Two steel stakes, yeah. Not a wooden stake that might snap off, but a steel stake. There are lots of supports on the market. What I would say is that unless you've got a very small patio tomato or container tomato, yeah, then you could use a tomato cage. Those, those probably don't get more than about knee high. But anything else needs more than a tomato cage. Okay, choosing a plant. Um, let me run through this and then I'll, I'll talk about the pictures. You want a nice, thick, green stem. You don't want to look at some spindly little plant that you think is about to fall over. And the darker green, the more they've been feeding it, but also the healthier it is. And eight to 10 inches tall. And I just, I know that here to here is eight inches. So this plant, is slightly more than my eight inches. So this is in the eight to 10 inch range. So if you need a visual, this is about the size tomato plant you wanna buy. And I have it in an extra container because it has drainage holes in the bottom. <laughs> but it's a nice thick green stem. It's, the leaves are a nice green color. You don't see any yellowing. Your hand may be bigger than mine, sir, but I know that this is eight inches for me. That's about, about eight. Well, for me it is. Yeah. Your hand's bigger than mine. That might be 10 inches. You'd have to get a ruler out. <laughs> You'd have to get a ruler out. Uh, yeah. But I, but I use this regularly for measuring things. Oh. Yeah. No blossoms or fruits at the time you, no blossoms or fruits at the time you buy the plant. Or, or when you buy. If you're buying a plant. No spots on the leaves and you have every right, I won't do it here, but if this were the pot it was in, you have every right to gently lean it over on the side, pull the pot off of it, and look at the roots. If it's already root bound, I would not buy it. Now, how do you look at the roots when it is in that thing there? Well, 
That's why I said, if, imagine that it's in this container, not this one. You lay it gently over on its side and you pull the pot off. If it's root bound, the roots are going to hold all the soil in place and you just put the pot right back on, set it up and say somebody else can buy that one. Because if it's already root bound, you need to gingerly tease all those roots apart, otherwise it's just going to keep doing this. Which, you want your roots to go out and find as... When we planted them, I remember getting down at the bottom of the plant with dirt and roots mm -hmm. and open it up a little bit. Yep. Yeah, if, if, you, if you know how to do that, uh, some people are not comfortable doing that. Oh, really? Yeah. Yes, you're one step ahead of me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I've been trying to convince my neighbor of that. But your grandpa is right, and I'll tell you why in a moment. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you why in a moment. So if you're, you know, this is in a, a little drinking cup that's probably 12 ounces or so, so that somebody started seeds in this. This is the size plant you want. Now, I cringe every time I see a plant like this and they're charging $15 to $20 for it. And people are buying it. And in a previous year when I did this talk, there was somebody who bought one of these in March and planted it outdoors. Well, guess what? You might as well have just burned that $15 or $20 because there was another frost which killed it, turned it to mush. But a, but a plant that is that big and not only has blossoms but has fruit on it goes through so much shock when you take it out of its pampered environment where it's been tended to and nursed every day at the nursery. Then you stick it in the ground, which is a little cooler, and it's saying, what did you do to me? And it's just going to sit there for a while until it adjusts. So, you know, for the 15 or $20 you spend on a plant like this, you can go buy a half a dozen plants that look like this. Um, I'd prefer not to comment, <laughs> and part of my that, that is a comment. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, here's my concern. It all depends which employee is responsible for looking after the plants. Sometimes there are employees who know something about plants, and then other times I have been in there and they've got the watering wand, and what are they doing? They're watering the foliage which makes them really susceptible to disease. Wet leaves just act like a magnet for any fungal spores that are floating through the air. And they're just always there. Uh, but then I've seen other employees who are appropriately watering the soil, not the plant. How do you know? How do you know who was tending those plants the last week? How do you know how long those plants have been sitting on the shelf there? Now, you can go try and find the lawn and garden center manager and say, when did you get this delivery? Or if he says the next delivery is on Tuesday morning, then I'd go shop on Tuesday afternoon before anybody's had a chance to mess with them. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So on, on the big box stores, it really boils down to the caliber of the employee who's taken care of them. Okay, so... The other thing, you go to the nursery or, you know, you find out when the delivery is coming to Home Depot and you buy it when it's just off the truck from the, from the greenhouse. Do not go home and plant it the same day. Do not plant it the same day because it's been in this pampered environment. So you, even when you buy a plant that looks like it's ready to go in the ground, it still needs, you can probably shorten the time from a week which is what we do with the seeds that we start and grow. But you probably still need at least three, if not four days to get it used to full sunshine. You walk into Home Depot or Lowe's or even most of the nurseries, look up, what do they have on top? They have shade cloth. So those plants are not getting full sunlight. You're gonna come home, plunk it in the ground cause this is the time to plant it. The soil is warm, I've got it prepped and we get a couple of 80 degree, 80 degree days with all that bright sunshine, and it's gonna stroke out, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah, it, it, it's gonna overdose and you'll get some sun scald and the like. 
probably won't kill it, but you're likely to be calling somebody saying, I just planted this thing and now it doesn't look very good. So harden it off means every day you expose it to more sunshine. If it's a cloudy day, you can leave it outside longer. If it's a bright day, then you know, avoid the peak of the day. Give it some morning sun or give it some late afternoon sun. But by about the fourth or fifth day, then leave it out all day and hopefully leave it out overnight at least once before you plant it. When you have hardened it off and you're ready to plant, plant it on a cloudy day, on a cloudy day, plant when it's cloudy, or if it's a bright day, then wait till later afternoon, early evening as the sun is a, getting a little lower in the sky. Plant deeply. Your grandpa was right. Now, why do we do that? <clears throat> yes. Tomatoes have all these little hairs on their stem. And if those hairs come in contact with soil or sufficient moisture, they will turn into roots. So I'm not dripping. I brought this particular specimen because if I were going to plant this today, the first thing I would do is pinch off this one and pinch off that one, and I would plant it that deep. And that's another two and a half inches that's going to grow roots. The more roots it has, the more nutrition it takes up. The more nutrition it takes up, the healthier plants you have. So this thing that is eight to 10 inches tall, when I put it in the ground, is now going to look like it's six or seven inches tall. Um, there are some folks who would advocate, if you, you know, every now, it hasn't happened with my tomatoes, but this year my tomatillas, which were planted at the same time, are probably 15 inches tall. There are folks who would tell you to plant it horizontally in a trench and bury half of it, and it'll, it'll straighten up, but then you'll have all these additional roots pulling in nutrition. So yeah, some of my tom tomatillas will probably get planted as deeply as I can get them in the ground. But now you don't recommend planting them on the side like that? If I've got a, a fairly tall plant, I will. If I have one this size, I don't need to. Yeah, okay. It's really, uh, you know, as a seed starter, on, t on the tomato packet it says start six to eight weeks before you want to set out. Well, my goal to set out is May 1. So I used to back up eight weeks. And what I found was my tomatoes were too big. I was having to up pot them. Well, that's a lot of time and effort. So I now go with, the, if it says six to eight weeks, I go with six. So I can tell you my tomato plants were started on March 20th, and most of them are taller than this by another two or three inches. So I'm thinking maybe next year I drop that down to five, in five, five weeks before I want to set it out. Five weeks. Yeah. At the time you plant it, water it pretty well. Don't, don't make it hunt for water. Then you want to start monitoring for pests and diseases. It starts as soon as you plant. You know, and the pests may be slugs that just crawl up the stem and eat leaves. Um, not so much on tomatoes, but some, some of the tomato relatives. Flea beetles will come in. Flea beetles love eggplant. Eggplants are actually in the same family. Um, keep up the consistent watering. And then prune for airflow and sunlight. And obviously, if you get any disease, get rid of that as soon as you see it. So I would tell you, I never go to the garden without my pruners hanging on my pocket in their holster. And snip, snip. And when, it's, when I'm working on tomatoes, the second thing I have is my spray bottle of Lysol. Because if I'm snipping something off of one plant, I spritz my pruners before I go to the next plant. The last thing I want to do is snip off a diseased leaf on this plant. And now this one, it's not diseased, but you know, it's got a broken branch. Before I snip that off, I want to get rid of any disease that was on my pruners. So, um, so spray I use spray Lysol as my dis disinfectant. No, I shake it off. Okay. Some people, no, some people use Lysol wipes. Some people like to use alcohol. Some people will use a bleach solution, but I 
would caution against that because bleach can cause your tools to rust. Um, on the airflow and sunlight, you know, as, as that indeterminate tomato in particular is growing and it's putting out all these shoots, the question was, do you pinch off suckers? I pinch off some of the suckers depending on where they are. The suckers are the thing that come up, here's your main stem and then you've got a leafy branch that comes out here. The sucker comes up in the middle and the sucker will make more fruit. So depending on the season, if I want more fruit, I may leave the sucker or just depending on how much green I've got growing on this plant, I may decide to take it off. And in many cases, I look at it this week and say, eh, I don't know, I'll leave it. Next week when I'm making my pruning cycle, it's like, okay, you get to stay or nap, you come out. And I like to stand back and say, can I kind of see through this or do I have a wall of green vegetation? I need to be able to see through it because that means on a breeze, when those fungal spores are floating through the air, they can just keep on floating. They're not going to get trapped in my plant. And the line that I put here on this example, I would recommend planting it, you know, where these bottom two leaves are as a minimum. And if it were my plant, I would plant it where the blue line is. I'd pinch off those bottom two and I would plant it that deep. You would plant it that deep? I would, pl I would plant it at the blue line, but at least do it at the yellow line. So you, so if you plant it where you first put your finger, you got about five inches. Well, yeah, and when we do 160 tomatoes at the community garden, what we do is we say, use these bottom leaves as your depth marker. Those things should be sitting flat on the ground when you have planted this. And then we have somebody come along later with pruners and snip those off. We don't leave them on the ground, but because we have volunteers, it's like plant it that deep, let those things lay flat on the ground and then somebody else comes along and, and snips them off. So they're built-in depth markers. But that would be my minimum. In my own home garden, I'd pinch them off first and then plant it a little deeper. So sometimes it's, you know, if you're working with your grandchildren, then maybe you use these as depth markers and that's where you plant them. If you're doing it yourself, which is what I'm usually doing, I pinch them off first and then I go a little deeper. Because the deeper they go, the more roots they'll make. Um, the more roots they make, the more nutrition they take up, the better, healthier plant you've got. Now, here's an interesting thing. When I start seeds, I usually put two seeds in a cell because they don't always, they don't all germinate. But in the case where they do, sometimes one gets big and one spindly, well, that's real easy to decide which one goes. But I had several that were like two of the same size. It's like, okay. I can't stand to throw one of those away. So I snipped it off and put it in a little container of water and it grew roots. So now I have a few more plants to give away. Well, I could remove it, but it wasn't spindly. It wasn't little. I mean to replant Oh, to replant it? Well, Sometimes you can tease them apart in the cell and sometimes you can't. There have been times I've tried to tease them apart and I've messed up both of them. So I find it easier to snip one off, stick it in water, and if it grows roots, well then it wanted to grow and I'll let it grow. But you can do the same thing with the suckers. Early in the season, when you're pinching off suckers, you can stick them in water and now you've got a replacement plant for mid-season. There you go. Yeah. You talk about sticking a sucker in water. What, what are you putting it in? Oh, a, a glass, a, a tumbler like this. Um, my fr it's filled with water and you just put it right there in the water. Yep. And in, two, and in two, no, it doesn't float very long because in two or three days it grows roots and the roots then holds it. Oh, yeah, well, in my case, I had multiple stems in one container. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't have that many. Yeah, I, I had a few, and many of them, both seeds germinated. And I had a few newer volunteers at the community garden who, for instance, really wanted a sun gold. 
Well, I don't know that you're going to find a Sun Gold when you go into the nursery or to Home Depot or Lowe's. You may, but I doubt it. Ace Hardware. Ace actually does a better job of taking care of their plants. Yeah. The, the one here on Hardin Valley has the best nursery section I've seen in a long time. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm not supposed to give recommendations, but if you're telling me should you go to Home Depot or Ace, I'd go to Ace. And I've had the opportunity to talk with some of the staff. I've watched how they water plants. Um, yeah. They're, for the most part, they're doing things right. Okay. Other questions? Tomatoes are a big topic. <laughs> 